Welcome, and thank you for joining the Xthera Medical sponsored webinar titled Mother Nature's Assistant, Why Glycocalyx Replacement Therapy is the Future of Medicine. Over the next 60 minutes, you'll hear the science and latest news around surrogate glycocalyx therapy found in the Seraph 100 pathogen absorption device. And with that, we'd like to introduce our speakers today. Leading off with Professor Herve Gerlach with the Department of Anesthesia, Intensive Care Medicine and Pain Management at Vivantes Clinicum Neukölln in Berlin, Germany, followed by Dr. Ming Chala with the Veterans Affairs Medical Center in San Diego, California. And with that, Professor Gerlach, please begin. Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody um, from Berlin. And don't worry, the weather is not, as you can see in my video, it's dark and rainy. Um, and I hope that it's a little bit better in the US. So before we can talk about uh, assisting mother nature, and this will be the first, uh, my first part of the talk, um, we of course first have to understand mother nature. And um, okay, so that's um, the first part of, of the talk is how uh, that we first should understand Mother Nature. And this means that in, um, in this context of the glycocalyx, uh, we have to understand the vascular endothelium as the body's largest uh, organ equivalent and its role in the patho or physiology of host response. It's important to understand why we have some reactions called host response and inflammation, as you can see here in a very typical local inflammation, which was described uh, more than 100 years ago by Rudolf Virchow with the four uh, main signs of reddish, reddishness, tumor, heat and pain if there's a swelling like you can see here in this boy. And this of course is not uh, a passive um, thing which we, uh, uh, which we observe. It's a very controlled mechanism by, with, by which mother nature tries to compartmentalize the infection which is the cause. And these mechanisms of local inflammation are extremely important for the body to survive, simply to say. And uh, as you can see here, the, where you have a focus somewhere in the tissue, we have several regulators by which this um, endothelium, which is nearby, is activated. I will come to this in more detail in a few minutes. And uh, by this activation of the endothelium, um, the host response is induced, which finally uh, is helping to reduce the local inflammation and finally uh, uh, to get rid of it. Uh, the mechanism how this is, uh, is done is, is quite uh, well understood. You see here a very uh, simple uh, cartoon uh, by a, um, a paper by John Cohen, and you see here it's nearly 20 years ago. And uh, the understanding is, is, uh, is quite well. We have dams and PAMs in the beginning on the left-hand side, like the uh, lipopolysaccharides. Uh, they are binding to toll-like receptors, TLR, the abbreviated, and then inside the cells, which are mostly cells from uh, the uh, myelid uh, compartment, like uh, monocytes or dendritic cells. They uh, got a complicated intracellular signal transduction pathway and then finally are producing um, uh, cytokines and other effector molecules. Now, how is this happening that this complicated mechanism works? So first, let's start with the toll-like receptors. Why are they called toll-like receptors? Well, it's uh, very simple because they were uh, discovered um, uh, years ago in insects, Drosophila melanogaster, and uh, they were called toll receptors. And later on, um, in, it was found that these, kind of, these receptors are also found in mammals, and that's how they call it toll like receptors. There are different uh, subtypes. Uh, we know, meanwhile, that some are typical for gram negative or gram positive bacteria, others. Uh, are, have mixed signals and by uh, uh, um, 
mixing these signals, we get different kinds of response. And by this, for instance, the body can also distinguish between uh, dangerous and undangerous bacteria. Um, Christiane Nostlein Follard received the Nobel Prize in 95 for discovering, and just uh, a, a small story, why are they called toll receptors? Do we have to pay a toll or something like that? No, it's simply because when she discovered these receptors, she called she loudly toll. Toll means in German, great. And this is the reason why they are called toll receptors. Well, if on the other hand side, we have these effector molecules which are produced by the macrophages. And uh, one of the most famous ones is the tumor necrosis factor, which uh, is, was uh, found by the group of Kevin Tracy and Tony Sarami. And uh, it was found that this body arm cytokine is able to copy uh, all mechanisms. If you inject this body arm protein in, in uh, animals, all signs of a septic shark like hypotension, fever, DIC, and so forth. And so it is a very important cytokine of septic shock. And also for this discovery, uh, uh, Bruce Beutler uh, received the um, Nobel Prize together with uh, Hoffman and Steinman in 2008. And just take, uh, uh, just note that this is a Nobel Prize for physiology. It's not for pathophysiology because they discovered how mother nature is acting uh, during infections and, see, and uh, uh, trying to fight the infection. Because in sepsis, and, uh, we have a bacteremia and then we have uh, a, a not, no longer uh, a, a localized uh, inflammatory response, but we have a general disseminated uh, inflammation in the whole body, in the vascular endothelium. And what does it mean? So first of all, um, this activated endothelium is increasing procoagulant activity by increasing the thrombin formation, reducing the anticoagulant activity of, for instance, activated protein C, and, and inhibiting the natural fibrinolysis by which um, the uh, normal body tries to react if there's some local fibrin clotting. And here you can see how these fibrin, uh, fibers are, um, are on the endothelial cells, are formed on the endothelial cell surface. And later on, uh, you see clots, in, in, for instance, in this uh, um, scan electron microscope picture. And as we all know, this is also a very uh, Im important way how coagulopathy and coronavirus uh, is induced. Uh, we know that, uh, that in all uh, uh, areas of the vasculature, even if it's a macrovasculature like arterial or ven venous system, but also in the microvasculature, uh, these mechanisms by activated coagulation is causing uh, local uh, um, perfusion mismatch as well as arterial thrombosis and severe venous thrombosis, which then may um, uh, uh, lead to severe pulmonary embolisms as they are seen very often uh, in uh, COVID-19 patients. And the mechanism here, a very recent uh, review is very, very similar as I showed you in these old slides 20 years ago. So this is, uh, uh, it's nothing actually new, uh, but the, uh, the variation how this is happening uh, is indeed a little bit uh, different from normal bacterial inflammation but the pathways are finally very similar. Other mechanisms are the sticking of leukocytes to the endothelial cell surface, which is induced by, uh, um, by um, adhesion molecules. Um, by this way, the endothelium binds leukocytes uh, to the surface. Then it opens up, which is an increased permeability of the, of the vascular endothelium. Here you see TNF-activated endothelium, and here you see the gaps which are opening after activation. And by this path, by this way, then the leukocytes can uh, walk through the opened up to the high permeability endothelium and then go to the, uh, to the location where the infection is, uh, is acting. <clears throat> 
And finally, we have vasodilation by nitric oxide, uh, which is also induced by activated endothelium as well as stimulated dendritic cells. Um, and also for this discovery, we have another Nobel Prize uh, of uh, uh, Robert Fershgott, Ignau and Murat in 1998. And again, it's physiology, what we are talking about, uh, important mechanism of host response. But of course, today we talk about the endothelium glycocalyx, which is one important mechanism of the vascular endothelium uh, to have an efficient barrier against uh, bacteria to, uh, uh, because they, this endothelium is an important barrier, so the endothelium should not be activated too much. And uh, this endothelial glycocalyx, uh, if it's formed correctly, is, is, a, is a real kind of wall um, against uh, water, uh, uh, for instance. So the permeability is, is decreased, the sodium permeability is decreased, and you have an effective kind of barrier function if it's intact. However, if we have a uh, severe infection, sepsis or, or viral, in, uh, bacterial or viral infection, uh, it might be shedded or it might be collapsing. And by this, the barrier function goes down. And uh, in this uh, nice review, uh, it was also shown that meanwhile, uh, it's known that uh, it's really binding uh, danger or pathogen associated molecular patterns, DEMS or uh, PEMS, uh, directly to this endothelium. And uh, a few years ago, it was also found that viruses are uh, actively bound to the glycocalyx, which is uh, formed uh, in the main part by heparin sulfates, which um, the following talk will go even more into detail. So it's a cornerstone of organ dysfunction if the vascular endothelium is disturbed, as it is in severe SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, here again shown in a, in a review with all these possible ways how this in, in uh, endothelitis uh, can be blocked, for instance, by tocilizumab, it's an IL-6 inhibitor, and we have the same mechanisms as I described before in severe, um, uh, in severe forms of COVID-19, which then uh, leads to these intravascular uh, clotting, as you see here in the lung, with the typical pictures uh, of the uh, pneumonia, and also in, for instance, here in the kidney, in the peritubular uh, uh, capillaries, where the procrial activity is leading to acute renal failure. Finally, we have, um, uh, by all these inflammatory mechanisms, an, uh, an anti-inflammatory syndrome. And this is a, a, um, a dangerous complication during COVID infection. Um, if by these mechanisms, which are in the early phases, inflammation and the shock and organ damage leads to immunosuppression, which then opens up the gate for secondhand infection. And you all know that secondhand bacterial infection during COVID are a really dangerous complication. So now, how can we handle that? So how can we got into uh, Mother Nature's home uh, to, let's say, modify this way? And most of all trials were a way to inhibit this way, to say, stop Mother Nature's way. For instance, by toll-like receptor inhibitors, there were several uh, approaches like this TAC242 trial with an inhibitor of the toll-like receptor 4. However, this study had, uh, this uh, trial had to be stopped. It was a, a large, uh, the so-called Takeda trial had to be stopped due to fertility. There was no benefit of this. Also by other molecules like uh, competitive inhibitors like Eritoran, they are mimicking they are wrong lipopolysaccharide, and also this trial, um, uh, the so-called excess trial years ago had to be stopped because there was no useful action of this treatment. On the other hand, I talked about these effector molecules, and I just want to show you the examples of nitric oxide inhibition. As I showed you, these, uh, the nitric oxide is synthesized, 
And uh, you can do this with so-called wrong arginine. So the nitric oxide synthase got a wrong substrate and then it's not forming a nitrate nitric oxide anymore. And uh, it, this was done in a large trial years ago. And this trial had to be stopped after the first uh, interim's analysis because it was shown here that uh, the survival in the survival curve here, the, 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 the solid line shows the treated patients and here are the placebo. There never ever have been any other clinical trial in intensive care medicine with all, such a kind of over mortality in the treated group in a large randomized trial. This was a dramatic failure uh, uh, in this, uh, to use this in this large trial. Later on, it was tried to make scavenging of, uh, of um, overloaded uh, nitric oxide in the blood, but also this trial, the so-called Phoenix trial, had to be stopped. It didn't work and it even caused some harm um, if uh, uh, then later on the, uh, the, the, uh, the data were published. So many of these trials are anti-antagonists, anti, and you see everything inhibitors always trying to inhibit mother nature's pathway. But obviously this was not successful. And maybe it was easier to hear from to Machiavelli who already said a hundred years ago, several hundred years ago, that hectic fever, sepsis at this time point, it's, it's inception, it's difficult to recognize, but easy to treat. If you don't treat it, it becomes easy to recognize later on, but difficult to treat. Very, very simple, but still absolutely true. And we have to learn that we have to treat this before this mother nature's pathway uh, goes and not by stopping this pathway, but to assist the normal physiological way how these bacteria or viral um, induction of this pathway is induced. This mean, that means that we have to reduce, for instance, the, uh, we have to increase the bac uh, bacterial clearance because it's known that uh, the mortality on the y-axis is increasing the more you have a bacterial load in the blood. And it's also similar for viral load as we see in the following talk. And the Seraph system is indeed mimicking the natural glycocalyx uh, as it is done here in the normal pathway. Mother Nature has its mechanism by blocking bacteria and viruses before they can act uh, at the cell. And uh, the uh, Seraph system is mimicking this mechanism by binding it to, uh, uh, to the to a non porous media. This uh, was shown in several bacteria, but also in viruses, more detail, as I said in the following talk. And uh, some uh, trials already showed that indeed, if you put it in a hemoperfusion system, this system is able to reduce the bacterial load, uh, uh, as you see here in the post cartridge samples, even after five minutes, you have negative blood cultures, whereas in the, uh, in the arterial line before in front of the, um, of the cartridge, you still have positive blood cultures even after two hours, uh, whereas the venous system is, uh, is already negative. But importantly, of course, if you treat long enough for, for two, four hours, then the whole blood cuts negative in these trials. So these are just to show you that uh, mother nature is not a fool. These systems of inflammation and host response are absolutely necessary to get rid of infections and to compartmentalize infections. And it's also very important to interfere in this mechanism very, very early in the earliest phase, stopping viruses and bacteria before they can act on the, on the human cells and uh, this, in the following talk, you will see more detail how this takes place. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you uh, very much, uh, Herwig. Uh, 
that was a lovely talk about the background. And um, I'm now going to take you guys through a brief talk about um, the Seraph and COVID-19 in particular. So basically, the first thing I want to do is do a quick disclosure. I'm currently the uh, chief of the scientific advisory board for Xterra Medical, and I think that's uh, important that everybody know that. I do not work for Xterra Medical. So <clears throat> I'm going to start with how I got involved with um, this entire concept in the first place, which was through a DARPA program. So for those of you who are unaware of what DARPA is, DARPA is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. It's a part of the U.S. Department of Defense, and they have a uh, singular and enduring mission, which is to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. And their claim to fame is the internet. Um, they also do other interesting things. They were a lead agency that actually invested in mRNA vaccines around five or six years ago because the idea was you could actually make them very quickly in anticipation of a pandemic. Um, and they also had this idea about a dialysis-like therapeutic program for pathogens. And so at the time I was working at George Washington University Hospital as a nephrologist and an intensivist. And since I was in Washington DC, um, there was lots of connections that I had to um, government agencies and next stage Fresenius was asked to be the platform. So they were the company that was going to basically provide all the pumps to help develop the program. <clears throat> and it was a really interesting idea. They said, you know, in the future, there's likely to be some sort of pathogen from a bioterror weapon or a pandemic or something, and we will have no treatments for it. And what we want to be able to do is do dialysis. And instead of taking off uremic toxins, what we want to be able to do um, that we want to be able to also take off pathogen. So instead of taking off urea, we want to be able to take off a virus or a bacteria or a fungus. But here's the tricky part, guys. You're not going to know what it is in advance. So it has to take off everything. And, and this was in 2013. And I remember thinking at the time, this is insane. This is science fiction. This is never going to happen. And this is something which doesn't even make sense that you could actually have a device that takes off every kind of pathogen. You have to know what the pathogen is in order for it to work. But they said, this is the goal. And the way this thing is set up is very interesting because it's set up like a playoff. So all these different um, companies come into the system, all their devices get tested on the next stage platform to make sure that they operate with it. Um, and then they do. And then what happens is all of these different companies get tasks assigned to them. So it'll be like, okay, take off Pseudomonas and take off Asinita Bacter Balmani and take off this and take off that. They get assigned the task, they go back to their labs and they come back three to four months later and you show the results. And for the devices that are able to cross these hurdles, they get advanced and they get more money and more funding. And for the ones that don't, they get knocked out. And so the device that won this competition was the Seraph 100. And that's how I uh, got involved with this technology because I had been working on the DARPA program. And so it's really interesting. You would think, wow, that's kind of cool that there is a device out there that can take off all this stuff that went through this very rigorous program. And so we started working on developing this to get this approved and available. Now, how does, how does this work, right? And that's an important question. And what system actually allows you to take off all this pathogen in a secular way. So it turns out it's, it's actually on the simpler side of the equation. It's polyethylene beads that have heparin attached to them. And it turns out that heparin sulfate um, has this extraordinary capacity to bind bacteria, virus, fungi, and toxins. And it's really quite striking. Um, and you think to yourself, well, that's interesting. How does that even happen? But I think the one thing I want you to understand is that in a device that's the size of a Fresenius F80, which is somewhere in the vicinity of 1.7 to 2 meters squared, instead what you have, because there are all these beads, is this massive, massive area where you're looking at uh, something in the vicinity of 40 meters squared. So when you put the blood into this membrane, you get 40 meters squared of surface coverage. And that's a lot of surface that the blood is being exposed to. 
And so we all think of heparin as an anticoagulant, right? So we give heparin to someone who has a pulmonary embolus and you know someone who has a DVT and it's an anticoagulant. But heparin is more than an anticoagulant, particularly if it's a surface. And so when you think about proteoglycans and what they do, it turns out these things grab on and attach to bacteria and virus uh, in a very distinctive and powerful way. And I think the most important thing that I want you to take away from this talk, if you remember nothing else, is that soluble heparin, the heparin you give someone intravenously, is very different than surface heparin. So when heparin is a surface, it behaves very differently when it's solubilized, interacting with the coagulation system. And heparin as a surface, it turns out, is a very effective surface for removing pathogen. And you think to yourself, well, that's wild. Why would that happen? And the reason is, is that it already happens. So it turns out your endothelial glycocalyx, which is this inner lining of a vessel here, is this gel-like fringe that sits and protects the inner lining of blood vessels in your endothelium. Now, most people think that this was just there as a protective polyurethane that sits above um, you know, the blood of uh, the blood vessel and the, and the endothelium. But it turns out this is a highly metabolically active substance. And what it does, in addition to protecting the endothelium, also turns out to have own pathogen grabbing activity. Now, the endothelial glycocalyx is made up largely of heparan sulfate which is not identical to heparin sulfate, but you can see how similar these two molecules are. And when heparin is put on a surface like it is in the seraph, it behaves very similarly to heparan sulfate. And this is why we believe that this device effectively is endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. And we know that the glycocalyx correlates to these disease severity, um, and as you get sick and as you get endothelial leak, your glycocalyx breaks down. And this is just to show you what this device takes off and the efficiency at which it takes things off. So what you can see here on the right is the efficiency of removal and look at the variety of bacteria it removes. Gram-positive MRSA, Staph aureus, Kleb, Strep pneumoniae, E. faecalis, strep pyogenes, serratia marcesans, acinetobacter balmani. It's this incredibly wide spectrum and it removes all of it. It also takes off viruses and it also happens to take off SARS-CoV-2, which is part and parcel of why we're having this talk in the first place. So we feel that the Seraph 100 is endothelial glycocalyx replacement therapy. And if that is true, what it will do functionally is offer you blood compartment source control. So it removes pathogen. It also attenuates the coagulopathy. It removes microthrombosis and attenuates DIC. And it has important ROS effects because the glycocalyx actually adsorbs um, oxygen free radicals. So if your own glycocalyx is broken down for whatever reason, then your ability to provide this service to the body is completely wrong, gone. And by being able to put this device on, you begin to replace that function. And so if you think about the management of sepsis and septic shock, you know, generally uh, as an intensivist, we think of this in three large buckets. So the first thing is source control, right? It, you know, if there's a big pocket of pus um, or if there is um, persistent bacteremia or viremia, you, you're not, the patient's not gonna get better right? Because this amount of bacteria in my room is going to overwhelm the immune system and people are going to die. And so this is where we think the device largely sits. If for people who have continued viremia, continued bacteremia, this is a device for source control. It's very important that everyone who's listening to this understands this is not, I repeat, not a cytokine removal device. The, the whole point of this device is not to take off IL-6. The point of this device is to remove pathogen. 
And when you remove pathogen though, good things happen, right? It's gonna improve your inflammation. As I mentioned, the device has important uh, effects on coagulopathy. Uh, it also happens to remove damps and PAMPs. And if you help the coagulopathy, if you remove damps and PAMPs, you remove pathogen, you actually begin to see a decrease in your pro-inflammatory cytokines. This is a secondary, albeit pleasant, but secondary effect of pathogen removal. But I want you to think of this device as a pathogen removal device. And if you remove pathogen and you have less inflammation, you also tend to see improvements in hemodynamic stability. But this is not the primary function of the device. These are nice downstream effects of the device. So I think one of the things that's also important to recognize is that the device does not remove antibiotics and importantly, it does not remove remdesivir. Um, and uh, we have done some some preliminary work and it does not appear to remove monoclonal antibodies. But I think in the position of where this device lives for course of therapy, there should not be significant overlap in those two areas. I think here's the real question. Um, you know, we've had COVID now for nine months, uh, just about anywhere, anywhere you are in the world right now, you're getting absolutely slammed with COVID. I live in Southern California and um, in Los Angeles, which is a little bit north of where I live, the ICU bed capacity is nil. They are running out of oxygen and ambulances are waiting in line to deliver patients. And I'll be very direct and honest, I never thought I'd see that in America. Never thought I'd see it and that's what's happening. And so we're, we're, our backs are up against the wall even though we have a vaccine. And I think the question is, is okay, that's great, Mink, but what the hell with viral pneumonia, right? Like if you have viral pneumonia and you're dying from hypoxemia, why do I need a device to treat viremia? And I think that is a good question and I'm gonna try and uh, answer it. So basically, if you look at the available data, um, what you'll see is that it turns out that the viral load in plasma is very strongly associated with COVID and COVID severity. So, Essentially, it appears to have the sense that you have three large phases of COVID. When you first get infected, your viral pneumonia, and then when you get really sick. So this is a paper that was recently published in Critical Care. And what you can see here is outpatients have very low incidence of viremia. And I think this is important to understand that viremia is not dynamic in that Day five, you get viremia. Day 10, your viremia is over, and then you get better or you get worse. That's not how it works. If you are not very sick, you don't have much viremia. If you get sicker and you're in the ward, you have more viremia. And if you become critically ill, you get a ton of viremia. So the thing that seems to map most directly with multi-system organ failure, severe illness, is in fact the viremia. And if you don't control the viremia, you die. And what they did in this paper is they looked at the impact of viremia on all of these different effects, which are measured on the left. And this is a heat map. Now, what you can see in bright red is when you have viremia, you get tissue damage, chemotaxis of T cells, inflammation, neutrophil degranulation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Viremia, makes all of this worse. It's Now the lung is bad and you're dealing with oxygenation, but we can oxygenate people. We can do VV ECMO. There's a lot we can do with oxygenation problems. What we don't do well with in the intensive care unit is multi-system organ failure due to unabated tissue injury. And that's what the viremia is directly contributing to. And so if you put this into a bit of a cartoon, what you see is the viremia itself essentially impacts SIRS, coagulation, tissue damage, endothelial dysfunction, et cetera. Importantly, when you dive into this paper and in the interest of time, uh, I didn't take you through all the details, viremia correlates to IL-6 levels, CRP levels, ferritin and D-dimer. All of the markers that we clinically at the bedside know are associated with the worst outcome. And so what you think to yourself is ideally, if you're going to say, I'm going to use a device to take down viral load, ideally you'd like to be able to measure the viral load. So in a perfect world, 
we would have a real-time PCR quantitative measure. Your patient would be in intensive care and you would measure it and you would get a value of 10,000. And you would say, oh, if you're above 300, we put you on the device and we continue to give you this treatment until you get down below a threshold. And that makes sense. Well, we don't have that right now. The technology is not there. It hasn't been rolled out fast enough in the pandemic, but it's not that hard to figure out who's viremic. It's the critically ill patients. If you're critically ill and you are circling the drain in the ICU, you have viremia. That's essentially what the data largely show. And the sicker you are, the more likely you are to have viremia. And moreover, the viremia itself appears to be what is driving most of the severity of illness. And so how do you set this device up? Well, you put it on a standard dialysis machine. Um, this is on an intermittent hemo machine, but it'll run on the Baxter machine. It'll run on a next stage Fresenius machine. It'll run on a Fresenius multifiltrate pro or multifiltrate whatever. Basically, if you can put a kidney on, you can put this device on and run the treatment. And in the US, um, this actually occurred, I believe in April. These are the first two case reports at Walter Reed um, Medical Center, which is a large military hospital in Washington, DC. Um, this is where, um, uh, this is essentially the leading military hospital uh, in the country. Two patients with uh, very uh, severe COVID were treated with the Seraph. I'll let you guys pull this publication on your own and not take you through the nauseating detail because I wanna allow time for questions. But these two cases had such a profound impact on these patients that it led the FDA to um, approve the device with the European use authorization. Is there a question? Yeah, sorry. So um, this device in the US is approved under emergency use authorization. This is the indication, which basically means anyone who's really sick. So if you have profound respiratory uh, uh, failure or you are in shock or have multiple organ failure. So basically this is indicated for patients who are in the hospital with high levels of oxygen therapy uh, and or critical illness. It's also CE marked in Europe for pathogen removal. And this is, I think the second most important slide of my talk, which is this is where we are, right? So there's been extraordinary science done um, in the past nine to 12 months. And this is sort of where we are. This is your pre-hospital COVID, your low flow oxygen, your high flow, and then you're in deep, deep trouble. And this is a basically about where you are in the hospital. You're hospitalized. If, in your, if you're in Europe, you probably don't get into the ICU until you're intubated. In the US, we do have a bunch of high flow patients in the ICU um, and they may or may not be intubated. So this is essentially the overlap of intensive care. And monoclonal antibodies have shown to be helpful largely in these patients. We also know remdesivir is valuable in patients who are on low flow oxygen. And from the recovery data out of the UK and from other studies that have supported this, we know that if you're really sick and intubated, um, dexamethasone helps you. Well, what do you do for these folks? They're on high flow oxygen and they're becoming critically ill. And as I've just shown you, these patients tend to have very high levels of viremia. This is where we're using the Seraph, and this is where we're having enormous success. And it happens to be a place where we don't have other options as well. So the device is approved in Europe and the US and um, clinicians who are using it are using it in this intervention point, um, not necessarily exclusively before they're intubated or immediately after intubated, but in this interface between here and here is where we largely see people using the device and this is just to show you some of the cases. All of these are currently uh, under review for publication. Um, and what we find is that when it's used early, the survival is very good, upwards of um, 78%. Um, these numbers will all need to be updated. We have so many more cases that are coming in, but I'll be very honest with you. Uh, clinicians do not have time to update the registry. So we are not getting data in as quickly as we would like. When you use it late, you get less of an effect. This is a single center experience in Forest Schindler in Hattiesburg. Um, and I wish I had very large RCT data to show you, but um, we, we currently don't. But what we basically find is patients who are at this point, who have hypoxemia, who are on their way to getting intubated. Um, they did a case control study based on availability, which was a convenience study. 
And what they basically found is an enormous difference in outcome. Uh, the patients who were able to get the CEREF in that intervention point had an 88% survival versus a control group of 17%. Uh, and these were reasonably well matched and hopefully this paper will be out shortly for everyone to see it. Um, and so, you know, in summary, I think the key thing to recognize is that high levels of SARS-CoV-2 viremia are very common in critically ill patients and appears to be a direct modulator of multisystem organ failure. Viremia itself is an important modulator of multisystem organ failure. That's what the available data strongly suggests. And it makes sense based on the pathophysiology. It is approved in the US and Europe for the treatment of COVID. Um, and the device effectively removes SARS-CoV-2. I think the most important thing when you're using a new technology that you're not so familiar with is knowing if it's safe. We all recognize that in medicine, at first we must do no harm, primum non nocere. We have used this device in over 200 patients with over 400 treatments, and we have not had a single serious adverse event. And so for people who want to offer something else to their patients, um, I think the most important thing people to recognize is that it's safe. And it may fill an important gap uh, for patients uh, with uh, COVID-19, viremia, and critical illness. I think the, to be fair and honest, you know, we would love to be in a position where we were showing you large RCT data or case control data. Um, but frankly, the pandemic came uh, before this device was uh, ready to go. And that's why it was emergency use authorized after uh, those case series that I showed you. And we have been um, rolling it out ever since. Um, not that anyone can plan a pandemic, but we would be in a much stronger position with more data had the pandemic come one year later. But uh, none of us had planned for this and uh, it continues to be um, an absolute disaster for almost all of us. Um, I think this is something which um, can be considered as a potential option. Um, and like I said, I think what we're really pleased to see with the available evidence is the current level of safety. Um, so with that, I will uh, end my talk and thank everyone for your attention and uh, look forward to hearing uh, any questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Chala, Professor Gerloff. Well, we would now like to open up the session to Q&A. And so if you haven't already, uh, please submit questions via either the Q&A function or the chat function here is fine. And our first question is, uh, can we describe more how the Seraph 100 uh, affects or doesn't affect drug absorption, the normal concentration in the plasma or uh, equivalent? Yeah, so that's a great question. It's been tested against a large slew of antibiotics and remdesivir. Um, and there's some preliminary data looking at, um, at uh, immunoglobulin, um, IgG, and it doesn't take any of that off. We, we are currently working on doing more studies to get more information out, but in general, it doesn't appear to interact with many medications. Uh, and the ones that we care about the most, vis-a-vis -vis antibiotics, antivirals, and remdesivir, it doesn't. Um, and we hope to get more information out there uh, shortly. I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, but I think we'll check. We might actually have some of this information on the website. Great, and a question for Professor Gerlach. What do you think is the reason for the different ability to remove Klebsiella multi-drug resistant? Well, that's a good question. Um, actually, um, if you measure the load, uh, bacterial load, it's all always uh, a sum of what is produced and what is um, absorbed. And to say that there is a different absorption um, is difficult to declare because uh, the uh, resistance of bacteria to um, to carbapenem, for instance, or multi-drug resistance, Klebsiella, it's, these are mostly functions uh, which are inside the bacteria and which are then interfering with the, with the target cell. So I cannot say why this is exactly the case, but um, it's not necessarily must be because they are absorbed differently 
because maybe the multi-resistant are growing more than the non uh, than the non-resistant one, which is quite easy to understand because the antibiotics, which is going uh, in concomitantly, um, they are not acting. So um, let's say uh, the Xerof and the antibiotics are two armamentums against the bacteria, and if the if the antibiotics are not acting because the drug uh, the bacteria is multi-resistant then we have an increased growth more than the non-resistant ones the absorption if the absorption is differently i cannot respond next question uh how do we uh what can we correlate between the experience in the u.s for COVID 19 patients and the treatment there uh, versus, say, the uh, pathogen shock, septic shock patient in Europe uh, outside of COVID-19? Yeah, I think this is a really important question. And I think that in general, uh, if you are removing pathogen from the blood, you're almost certainly doing a good thing. Um, I think that the both pathogens, whether it's bacteria or viremia in the blood, clearly have negative impacts uh, and contribute to multi system organ failure. I do think that timing is important. I think that for both, both bacteria and viremia, it's almost certainly the case that giving the therapy late um, is probably not a good idea. And you wanna have it early in the course of disease before end organ therapy kicks in. I think the question that we don't know the answer to for which when we get better diagnostics and quantitative diagnostics that are important are thresholds. You know, how much um, bacteria bacteremia reduction, do you need to see the effect similar for viremia? And in essence, the dose, how many treatments do you need to give? Do you treat to blood sterility? I think for bacteremia, the answer is yes. I think for viremia, it may be more of a threshold beneath a certain level than true sterility. Um, those are open questions. We have a sense that the appropriate number of treatments for the seraph is somewhere between two to four treatments over two to four days, one filter per day. Um, but those are areas which will require more calibration. Um, so I think there are some similarities, but there may be some differences in dosing. I'd be interested in Hervig's view of that. I really also, I'm, I'm not able to, to declare because the, the, uh, the way we have uh, one center, which is in Hanover, which has now more than 20, and uh, so far we do not have the, um, the data published and it's very difficult now to, to have just the simple experience to say how many patients were treated and um, the, the experience of the clinicians who are doing this is very positive because there's a hemodynamic stabilization. And, uh, but I'm to really say if there's a difference between the US and, 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 and the European experience, I cannot answer that, sorry. Thank you, and question, questions for Dr. Chella. In the ICU setting, we see COVID disease patients in different phases. How do you differentiate between worsening of their situation due to COVID viremia or due to secondary immuno immunological hits? And secondly, we see often after 10 days, increased levels of IL-6, et cetera, for which NPS is needed to control the situation. It'd be nice to have some idea or tool of a recurrent viremia before instituting a serif membrane in such a situation. Yeah, I think that's a fair point. We don't have that diagnostic for viremia. And so what I would say based on the available evidence is the place you should be using the seraph is as a patient is approaching intubation or within 48 hours of intubation. Now, I'm not saying that there aren't patients who are viremic who couldn't benefit outside of that window, but it's pretty clear that those patients in that window, A, have no other option and B, tend to be viremic. And so instead of guessing, I would just focus my care there. I think if you get comfort with the device, and you can use ferritin and D-dimer um, and CRP as um, easily measured bedside measures to get an assessment for where you think you are. I think it's not unreasonable to use that as clinical triangulation, but I think you focus on where you have nothing else. Um, we have nothing for a patient with high flow oxygen needs going to intubation or early intubation. So you, you don't have an option 
clinically that's shown you to be helpful. You have something which is approved and might be helpful and is safe. And you know, those patients tend to be biremic. So that's where I would focus the attention. Um, look, we've had extraordinary saves with patients who are very late, some who are on ECMO and had extraordinary responses. But th statistically, that's less probabilistic to happen. Um, and I think, um, you know, uh, the Sutton rule, which is, you know, they ask Billy the Kid, why do you rob banks? And he says, that's where the money is. I think the value proposition for the seraph is largely in that arena, high flow oxygen in patients who are threatening to need mechanical ventilation. And it's also where the unmet need is logistically. We do cannot afford to put more patients in ICU beds. Uh, and so the other main reason we see a lot of use in this space is if you take a patient with high flow oxygen and they don't need to be intubated, that's a patient who's not going to be a rock in your ICU taking up a bed for the next, you know, 21 days. So there's lots of reasons why there is broad alignment on that patient area, which is the pathophysiology, the lack of other options, and logistically, we need to create more ICU beds or at least prevent the available ICU beds from being taken. Maybe I can, can add something concerning the, the, uh, the measuring the viral load, because this is a key issue here in, in, in Charité is the, the largest center treating um, COVID patients uh, in Germany. And um, they are developing different techniques. So uh, in the Charité, for instance, they take uh, quantitative nasal swabs. Uh, this was shown in a recent paper in the New England Journal, I guess, four weeks ago that uh, also by nasal swabs, um, it could show that you have a, syst a systemic treatment, in this case by uh, a, a special group uh, immunoglobulins, you could show that there's also a decrease in the quantitative nasal swab. Um, the direct measuring of the viral load in the serum is very difficult. They are working on that. And um, so we hope that in the next weeks or months, we will have a good um, essay uh, to estimate the severity of the patients. Um, as I remember, there was a question for re-deteriorating um, if the patient is re-deteriorating, for instance, by secondary bacteremia. Um, uh, we see sure. that in these patients which are improving and then later on re-deteriorating, um, uh, the PCT, the procalcitonin, is very good distinguishing between uh, a, real, uh, a, a, a viral load again and the bacterial, secondary bacterial infection. We use this uh, in, in estimating uh, how the treatment is. For seraph, this makes no difference because in both uh, cases, uh, if it's bacterial or viral, uh, it's a useful tool if the patient is re-deteriorating. Thank you, Professor Gerlach and Dr. Chella for your presentations and insights. The Seraph 100 is CE marked and available for use in Europe and emergency use, use authorized in the US for use with COVID-19 patients. If you'd like to learn more or try the Seraph 100 yourself, we encourage you to visit www.xtheramedical.com or contact us at info at Thank you again, and this concludes our presentation.